Hey again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm. Well, I've been working on something and I'm ready to show it to you today. It's a chart of the different varieties and classes of roses. To this point, I've been doing them individually. So I do a video on the Damascs, the Gallicas, the Centifolias. This time I've put them all together onto one chart that shows you how they are related to each other. I hope you find it useful. You can let me know. Okay, I've zoomed in on the chart here and here's the way I hope you can use it is by selecting a rose group that we're talking about like for instance the Portlands in the center here and placing into the context of the other rose classes and families going back through history. So the Portlands for instance if I follow it up you can see following the red lines upwards that they are the offspring of the Autumn Damask on the left here and on the right that they are the offspring of the Gallicas as well. So the Autumn Damascs and the Gallicas together made the Portlands, and the Portlands, if you follow them downwards to the related offspring classes, they were an important uh, predecessor of the hybrid perpetual class. So that's the way I hope you can use this, but to make it make sense, what I'll do is I'm just gonna take it right from the top down to the bottom, uh, going through the groups and classes by their by their eras. So here I have the ancient cultivated rose classes and these are the ones that were recorded before 1580 and would have been the roses that were known to uh, the historical Romans, Egyptians and the Middle East as well as China. Although again we're not 100% sure. The further back we go in time the less certain we are about these roses. Certainly, I'll give a note on the Chinas here is that we've divided them here into two different classes, the teas and the China roses, the teas being the taller, uh, more climbing type roses with the pointed buds that became important in later breeding of the hybrid teas. And the China roses, which is like a catch-all group uh, that includes all of the other roses that were cultivated in China. Now, we only know a handful of them uh, as they came into the trade in Europe and entered into the breeding of the other garden roses. Now in the red, so I, I color-coded all the ones that originated in China for sure, uh, in the blue, and the red is to indicate all the ones that came through that sort of Middle Eastern ancient civilization of the Mediterranean group. So these would have been known to the, say, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the, uh, the Greeks, and the Romans. And the four groups that I'll highlight here are the Gallicas, the Albas, the Damascs, and their cousins, the Autumn Damask. And it's a variety that blooms not just once, but blooms twice in the year. So uh, there's some debate about whether that really is something that was present in the ancient world or whether it came a little bit later. Uh, in any case, I've, I've indicated it here because it becomes important in the offspring. So moving on to the next group here, I, that, those are, that's the sum total of all the roses that were basically present before 1580 for sure. The other old garden rose classes, the ones that were introduced or recorded from 1580 to 1867, that, that defining date 1867 is the date that they sort of estimate the hybrid teas took over, and that's the era of the modern roses. So here in the old garden roses, following along that same red line from those four original uh, Middle Eastern and European roses, came sort of a catch-all category called the centifolias. And the centifolias emerged in Holland around 1580. I've done a video on that one separately, so I won't go into great detail on it here, but it's quite certain that the Damascs and the Gallicas were in its parentage. Also, they did, by genetic testing, establish that Rosa Moscata, uh, a wild rose, Rosa Phoenicia, and Rosa Canina. So you'll see in the orange there, I've placed any wild ancestors that I could track down as further parents into that group. And it's quite uh, likely as well that the Alba roses featured somewhere in the centifolias. The first centifolias being described around 1580. And they had a sport of the centifolias that was described around 1720. That's the centifolia moss roses with that mossy uh, scented covering on the, uh, on, the, on the buds and the stems of the rose. So. From there, there's only one more I have to describe that's in the group that's sort of pure-blooded 
from that Middle Eastern European parentage, and that's the Portland Roses. And that was bred a little bit later on, we believe, from the Autumn Damask and the Gallica Rose. And the interesting thing about it is that it seems to have taken after its Autumn Damask ancestor and be a reblooming rose. So it's kind of a, an anachronism amongst the uh, Middle Eastern and European roses that it was a reblooming rose. That's a characteristic that's much more closely associated with the Chinas. Speaking of the Chinas, it's around this time here that we start to see the China roses arriving through trading back in Europe. Uh, so the plant collectors went busily about the world plundering other cultures and societies and, and grabbing their plant material. And uh, some of the China roses, although they were probably purchased legally from, from nurseries in Shanghai, um, came back around this time. And some of them ended up here where you see the bourbon class. And the bourbon class was bred initially, actually not in Europe, but was an accidental crossbreeding on uh, the Isle of Bourbon, or Réunion, as I guess it's called now, uh, from the Autumn Damask and a China Rose. And I think the China was Parsons Pink, I think, or Old Blush. And uh, that was around 1820. At just about the same time, over here, we have an American uh, breeding of the China Rose, which was the Noisette Rose around or at the same time, 1820, bred also from Parsons Pink and Rosa Moscata. That's a wild ancestor there. So we have the Noisette Roses and the Bourbon Roses as kind of the pathway of the newly arriving China Roses being bred into the breeding line. So you can see a green line coming there from the bottom right of the Noisette. Also, the green line moving from the Bourbons. So those were two of the ancestors, along with the Portland Roses and the Gallicas way up here that featured prominently in this group that I'm putting in the center now, the Hybrid Perpetuals, which were sort of a catch-all category, grabbing all of the new China breeding and all of the European breeding and putting them into one category once they had achieved reblooming characteristics from the Chinas and also from the Portlands, I guess you could say. So around 1840, that's when that big catch-all happened with the hybrid perpetuals. <clears throat> now, at around the same time, I should just catch you up on the left here, is that the Noisette Roses had been used to breed with this ancestor up here, the tea roses, and became sort of the pathway of the tea roses coming into the breeding lines of Europe. So that was the tea noisette, and there's no certain date on when that arrived. We almost immediately from the noisette roses being bred, started back crossing and breeding over to the tea roses. And that there became a very important parent too. I'm going to follow it down to the right here. You can see it, the green line that comes from there and then crosses it with the hybrid perpetuals becomes the parent of the hybrid T rose, which is the basically the dominant modern rose category. So at this point here, I've described all of the roses of the old rose classes, except for this bad boy on the far right here, Rosa spinosissima, or the Scots roses. I'll come back to that in a little while. It was certainly bred in that same time period, but it's not really related, at least in a major way, to any of the other groups. So uh, in order to not disrupt what I'm saying here, I'm going to continue onward down to the hybrid teas. Now the hybrid teas are an interesting group because once again, they come from that catch-all group of the hybrid perpetuals, but they also come from the teen noisette. So they just have a, a whole bunch of different genetics in them. And we didn't stop right there because if you look on the right here, the hybrid perpetuals branched off and there was Rosa Fetida Persiana uh, was bred into them. And that happened around 1900. So the very first, the earliest of the hybrid teas were bred around 1867. But the breeding of the hybrid 
perpetuals did not stop at that point. They were bred in with the uh, hybrid, the uh, sorry, into the Pernetiana group, which brought in a bunch of different colors. In fact, it brought in a lot of the uh, yellows and oranges and really sharpened up the red a little bit and gave it some more saturation until you got the really full range of the colors that are available in the hybrid teas today. They also take the blame for black spot being present in roses, although I'm not sure that's a fair reputation. Now I should go back over to the China side now and just see what's happened over there. So following down from the straight up from the China ones, we have, I'm gonna actually lead you back up to the Noisette roses because if you follow the orange line here, the Noisettes were later bred back down into a Rosa Multiflora hybrid, the hybrid Multifloras, along with a wild rose. That Rosa Multiflora hybrid became a really important parent because it was used afterwards for two things. It was used in the hybrid Multifloras and it was used for the polyantha class. And the polyantha class takes some of its ancestry from that multiflora and some from Rosa, from the China Rose. So if you look at those two there, the polyanthas uh, were used in making, I'm gonna just go up one second here. If you take this frame here and say the polyanthas became an apparent of the floribundas along with the hybrid teas. And the floribundas, uh, sort of dominated a little bit later than the hybrid tea. So the hybrid teas have become sort of the large flowered dominant group and the floribundas became the cluster flowered dominant group. And that cluster flowering came from, you guessed it, Rosa multiflora. On the other side, that Rosa multiflora and that cluster flowered characteristics became an important parent of the hybrid musk roses. Okay, I'm almost exhausted on this side here, except that there's one more thread to pull, which is if you look in the center there at Rosa Chinensis Rouletti, that one is a, a selection of the China Rose that was bred along with polyanthas and floribundas and all sorts of other parents to make the miniature roses. And the miniature roses are sort of a, a catch-all of every rose that has become quite small. So. I'm, I'm representing it with three different parents here, but it, it in fact has plenty of different parents and has become a parent itself into other classes. And finally, I'm gonna say that between the hybrid T and the Floribunda, they recombined those at a certain point and that made the Granda Flora roses, which are both large flowered and cluster flowering. So that covers basically all of it now I did say I would go back and talk about these guys on the right here. Now I've used red to talk about those of European and Middle Eastern origin. I talked about blue as those that were descended from the China roses. The orange I'm using to represent those that are descended from other species that were neither from the Chinas nor from the Middle Eastern European side. So this one here, the Scots Rose, was descended from Rosa spinosissima, and with a few exceptions was pretty much its own group with a, um, a lot of doubles and around the uh, early 1800s became quite a fashion in uh, England particularly but also throughout Europe and I think there were something like three or four hundred different varieties introduced in this period so uh, it actually became quite a large group for a time. And down here, the Rugosas also entered into the breeding uh, melee somewhere around 1890. And from there, there were a lot of breeders tried their hand at it, and it became an important parent of a lot of the shrub roses today. I have one other group here that I'm going to include, although it's debatable whether it should be included in this way, is the English roses. And that's on the bottom right there. These are the David Austin roses, and he started breeding them around 1961. And what he did is, like any good breeder these days, he didn't pay much mind to where the parents came from by class. He wouldn't hesitate to include anything that he thought was a promising parent. So he took some from the red, which is from the 
European and Middle Eastern origin. He took some from the blue, certainly, that were from the tea and China origins. He took some that were from the orange, in this case, primarily from the hybrid musk group. And he took some from the green, of course, which includes all the modern floribundas, grandifloras, and hybrid teas. So he wasn't choosy about where he got his genetics. I think he was just very choosy about what made a good rose. And so what they've done um, in terms of classifying his roses is they've kind of lumped them into a group called the shrub roses, which also include the hybrid rugosas, which also include the Scots roses, which also include the hybrid musks, because they don't know what else to do with these plants of really, really complex breeding. And uh, that, so the David Austin roses have gone into that. I'm going to make one more comment here is that no matter how you search this list, you're not going to find anything that says climbing rose. That's a tough one because a climbing characteristic is not a breeding of a rose. It actually is just the way that the rose grows. So you will find, in fact, climbing grandifloras, climbing floribundas, like climbing iceberg, climbing hybrid teas. You'll definitely find climbing uh, hybrid musks. You'll find uh, climbers in the tea noisette and the noisette groups. You'll find climbers in the bourbon group and the Portland group, sorry, not in the Portland group, but in the hybrid perpetuals for sure. So they're all over the map and saying something's a climber or saying something's a rambler is more a description of its uh, growth characteristics and it's not going to be easily represented on a list like this. So, uh, uh, oh, even, even the miniatures have a few climbing members. So that's, uh, that's funny too. And I think I'll leave it right there, except to say uh, thank you so much for watching. If you found this useful, please let me know. And certainly I don't expect that this effort is going to be the final effort in categorizing all the roses in relation to each other. And if you know something more than I do or want to make a correction, please feel free to drop those into the comments below. Thanks very much.